Spirituality makes a person compassionate and full of empathy. Sometimes these are perceived to hamper ambition, growth in terms of employees. How could you still drive this passion and hunger for the person working? You know, uh, we have uh, three values that we live by in our group. Uh, we have three values that we really follow in the group. It is knowledge, gyan, action, karm, and care as in bhakti. So knowledge, action, care, that's also derived from the Gita, so nothing. And I can tell you this, I should have spoken, I thought I limited. But these values are really global values. Because today our business is more outside of India than inside. And yet people relate to each one of them. And in care there are two things about, one is about, uh, it talks about employees, so compassion and all that is one of them. And I think uh, compassion and empathy, if people really realize that you have that, I think they actually respond to you much more and they work more. I'll give you an uh, example. It's because of this compassion that we had for people, which was over many, many years, that recently we had an occasion where we had 400 scientists working in Mumbai. And that business or that activity was not doing as we wanted to. And therefore, we had to close it down. Imagine if you have 400 people in Mumbai, and if you want to close down something, all of you who have been involved with any industrial relations will say that it is a big challenge. But frankly, we could solve it because people believe that till now we had a compassionate attitude and it did not take us one day. I mean, whatever we said, it happened. So in some ways, when you've done it over time, it actually helps you in business. It does not make, it does not detract in any which way. Okay, um, it's a question from Vivek Karve. You created value from 1,000 crores to 18,000 crores. How easy or difficult was it to sell it? Were there any moments of truth? You know, the moment of truth is that one must not really worry about the result. Then it comes in. And one must also be prepared that if it does not happen, it does not happen. When you have that strength in you, that, that is what we got the valuation that we did. It's only because we had the strength. We were willing to walk away. So it was a, I mean, and you don't, you don't have to believe me, but it's true that it took only about an hour and a half of discussion. This is the value. It's only because we had the strength to give away. If you have that strength to walk away from something, only then can I think, uh, you can demand a value that you feel is, there should be a logic to it, which we had. And I have found that repeatedly, that uh, if there's not that much attachment that I have to get something, I have to get that result, then the result comes. Uh, so, I mean, connected question, if you will. What has been your guiding force to carry out the m and in the eventual sale of the pharma business? So the guiding thing is our value of trust, uh, our value of trusteeship. What does trusteeship mean? What is the definition of a trustee? A trustee is somebody, there is a wealth that has been given to you, there's an asset that has been given to you. And the trustee's job is to see that the best value is created of the asset for the benefit of the beneficiaries without any personal benefit. That's important. So who are our beneficiaries? We look at our beneficiaries as shareholders, as customers, as employees, and as society. And every time when we've done anything in the business, we've seen how it creates value for these 
beneficiary. And that's how we built the business. We felt that it created value for them through m and When we sold out that business, we felt that it created the best value for all the beneficiaries. So that's been the guiding and only principle. Okay. Um, this is for Mr. Biramal, but I would choose to toss it to Swamiji. If we create our own destiny, then is there anything that's predetermined or any aspect of life which is predetermined which can limit us? I request Ajay Bhai to first speak on this, then I will speak. Sure. That is not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, I have to tell you this, you know, often before we met Swamiji, I used to read the Gita, but I can only give one more advice is that you need a teacher to explain it to you. Otherwise, it goes over your head. So whatever it is to bring it down to life, to make it real, you need a teacher like Swamiji. And I'm not exaggerating because all these things we had read before, but to practice it is, or to really inculcate it inside you, you need somebody to teach it to you because there are so many nuances. And I find that very often we, re we do the same shlok maybe uh, after one or two years and he gives the even deeper interpretation so uh, that's what so it is. So would you feel your definition of destiny or, or rather understanding of destiny changed over time with knowledge and, and learning and sharing with Swamiji? I think yeah knowledge is the most important to actually change it is changing now I'm coming to this thing that everything is predetermined I don't want to even talk about that that will confuse everything because we are just mere instruments. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to tell you confuse. Even me, it confuses. But I think, uh, sorry, what was the question? No, if we create our own destiny, then is there anything that's predetermined or any aspect of life which is predetermined which can limit us? I hope I've got the question right. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. So to some extent, where you are born is predetermined. There's some mass where you're a male, female, this, that, all that is predetermined. But I think uh, what you do today, you can also, what we do today, I believe, is that we are building our future. And the predetermination for the future comes from what the action we do today. And therefore, sometimes maybe we may, I mean, today you may not see the benefit, but that's how I look at it. So, uh, as I keep telling everybody, one of the reasons why we must give back to society is just to, it's our insurance for the future, that at least, you know, in this life or in the next life, you'll be better off than before. Okay. I think that's it. What uh, Ajay Bhai said covered it. What is predetermined is determined by my own past karma. A lot of it which is destined is destined by my own past karma and I do have a lot of choice in the present how to face it and that is going to create my future. So at, at the level of karma and choice, that's the way to understand that predetermination is not something which is to limit me, it is only to give me the result of my own karma. And what he spoke about the instrument, that is also true but at a higher level. Where the devotion and surrender is so high, that a person really feels I am not the doer, I am only an instrument and things are happening through me and not by me. So that's the absolute level of surrender. And many times we are not able to live at that level again and again. We have to lift ourselves to that level. So we are at the level of choice. So at the level of choice, we have to make the best choice that is going to create our future. And that's where it is said that do the action dedicated to the higher purpose, that creates our destiny. Either ways, the concept of destiny will not limit, whether you take it as karma or we take it as predetermination. Okay, thank you. I am going to now reverse it, Swamiji. I am going to give you Ajibai's question and then Ajibai can answer it after you. What is the importance of perception in corporate success? How does one handle negative perception? So we'll have a, maybe a, a spiritual view and then a corporate view. Okay. So, definitely perception plays a big role. All of us know that. But I would say that there are two ways of perception. One is an outside-in approach, other is an inside-out approach. 
So outside in approach is that how the society perceives, how the people around perceive, how they think about me, my work, my business, my team. That makes a big difference and a lot of efforts are being done for that. And that's where many times to create the perception and the image in the minds of people, somewhere we tend to take the shortcut, somewhere we tend to do things very fast or do a certain slight compromise. It may happen. Because I want a certain image happening in the minds of people. The inside out approach would be that my perception about myself and my work is so strong and it is intrinsic motivation, which is where what he said about integrity matters. That integrity is what I value and based on that, whatever way the people perceive, that is up to them and future will show what has to be, what, what is the consequence going to be. So the example that he gave about Gandhiji, Gandhiji didn't worry about what would be the perception of my client, what would be the perception of the future clients of mine, of society, because he was driven from inside. That is an inside out perception that he had very clear value for truth and he stuck to that. Same way for Ahimsa. So when he followed that, even today the perception about Ahimsa and about Gandhiji, a lot of perception is not appropriate or people do not understand him in its depth. And it may have a certain context in spiritual life, it may have a certain consequences in the political life, there is no denial of any of that. But he did not change because of external perception, he stuck to his perception. So one aspect is that. And how to change the negative perception also I would say, but as long as I am positive and rooted in my value system, slowly, slowly the negative perception will also change. So actually, I agree with what Swamiji is saying. So perception, okay, in the business world you say you have to have the right perception and all that. I think it's in the short term. In the long term, reality catches up with perception. And then, if it is very, very different, then there will be consequences which are adverse. So I think, okay, at some times you have to manage perception. Now let's take the case of the Maggie noodles and Nestle. Now I don't know what the facts are, so please, and I'm not, uh, not going into detail. But today the perception is very negative of noodles and Maggie. So they'll have to do things to correct that perception. Otherwise the future of that is of the Maggie brand is not very high. But if the perception, what is perceived and if reality is the same, then there's no future. On the other hand, if it's wrong, the perception today maybe that's very bad, but in reality it's not that bad, then that will prevail in the long run and you have to manage that perception. But ultimately the perception is also you know, internally you will not be happy. You may fool everybody at the end of the day, I'm such a great person and build that perception. And in India, is, or globally it's very easy to build. You know, the media really can hype you up and all that. For some time you start believing it also yourself. But at the end of the day, you will not be happy internally because you know that this is not right. And that is where you'll not be at peace with yourself. So in the long run, what you think inside, that is the real thing, is what will work. Um, it's an interesting question, Mr. Piraman. Gita talks about creation, sustenance, and destruction. Nowhere is this impermanence more visible than technology startups. It's a little business oriented with a spiritual twist question, maybe. Why have you stayed away from this? Is it because it's high risk? No, it's not. Uh, actually, uh, in some ways, it's not uh, that we've stayed away from it. Uh, we have a venture which is really looks a lot into the future. This is in the US. It's all about data. It's all about how you convert data, data analytics, to convert it into insight. So that's one of the investments that we've made, which is out into the future. But it's also true that it's difficult to understand technology. And, uh, you know, they say that if you're about 25, sometimes you can't understand the technology that's going on. And it's true. So that's true. you have to have, uh, I mean, it's not so easy to do it. Like you s look at 
one of the, I mean, the world's best investors, Warren Buffett, and he said, I don't do technology because I don't understand, understand it. it. Yes. So it is, it's not that, I mean, so understanding or knowledge is also important. So much if I had to ask you the same question, um, the impermanence of technology in the view of, as we see uh, life and spirituality, does that have any similarity or anything that would you like to share? See, life, anyway, in Vedanta, we always say that everything is impermanent and it is changing. So there are two ways to look at e any of this. One way to look at it is because it is changing, if I have the capacity to constantly keep up with that change, and which is why in business, anyone in corporate world, innovation is such a very big word that one has to constantly keep innovating because you have to keep pace with the times which means involve, I mean, invest in research, which means invest in so many other knowledge solutions, and I have to know, and I have to be two steps ahead, which if I can't do, then I should know, okay, this is my core competency, and stick to those core competencies, and make the best out of those. Either ways, if the clarity is there, one will take that approach, and one will just do what needs to be done. Um, for Mr. Piramal, how do you counsel your management team to actually implement and execute the Sangam philosophy that you spoke about in actual practice? Um, I'm sorry, it's not too legible, but I think the question is pretty much in there. How do you counsel your senior management team to actually implement and execute the Sangam philosophy? What, how do you motivate them? It's, I mean, it's really, uh if you involve people in important positions for the p company that you've acquired and your people and treat them as equals, that is what makes the difference. And that is what, so people, you can give as much or lecture as you like, but in practice, how do you do it? I think that is important and that's what we try and do. It doesn't mean that if somebody, I mean, therefore we will take action if somebody we find is not good. We may change that. That's fine, people appreciate that, that it is on the basis of performance. It's not on the basis that just because you belong to a company which was taken over and therefore you'll be asked to leave or you'll not be given responsibility. I think as, an, as people see that, that's the way people get empowered and they believe you. And your strategic team also shares the same kind of knowledge or yes, the seeking you know, of knowledge as you do? Yes, over time now, you only attract the same type of people. I've seen that that's the culture of the organization that you create over time. And therefore, there will be, it, it, it's not necessarily the best culture, it's your culture. Another organization may succeed with something else, but we have a particular culture and we'll attract people who are aligning themselves to that culture. Otherwise, our system is such that they will be thrown out or they will be rejected. So it's like, how a foreign body is rejected, that's how it would be. But if somebody comes in with that culture, they are most welcome and that's what happens. We found that over time, we've had many fresh new people coming in, but they are aligned with this culture of ours. Okay. Uh, Swamiji, this one goes out to you. Purpose of life, I'm, I'm dipping into something that was asked earlier today. So, um, purpose of life is, purpose is like a moving uh, object. In such a situation, how does your life take shape? So the immediate purpose may be moving, but the purpose when a person discovers, it's a continuous journey. Just like an immediate goal and a very long-term goal. So sometimes immediate and short-term purpose, that keeps changing, but what is necessary to discover the purpose of my life to which I can dedicate myself. And then once one does that, it's a constant journey, it keeps going on. Okay. Uh, Mr. Piramal, do you feel you are giving enough time for all that you want to do? If so, how do you manage your time amidst all your commitments and yet have time for all that is personally close to your heart? So I don't think I, I, I give enough time to what I... Your wife is not here, you can be honest, it's okay. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> no, because there's always more to do. There's always more to learn. There's lots of new things to do. So I don't think I give enough time, but I think uh, one has to just, I, I don't know, just manage with whatever time it is and re recognize that you don't do enough of everything. I don't do enough of study of the Gita, for instance. That's true. Uh, Swamiji tells me that I should try and write some of these experiences. Now that's been a thought for me for a long time. But I have not even made any progress from other than that thought or not. So there are so many other things. I would like to do more travel. I would like to do more, so many things. But one has to compromise, I guess. The other thing I found is that if the more you do, actually you can find more time. Because then you can compress, you become more efficient somehow. So I used to think I was busy 30 years ago when I did a small work. Now I think I'm as busy and it's, uh, so I don't know. Okay, there's one more for you, sir. Um, how does one tackle the conundrum of personal values and philosophy? And is it um, aligned to organizational somethings and goals? So firstly, is there a conundrum in your personal philosophy and values against your organizational values? No, so fortunately in the position that I am, I can impose my personal values in the organization. It is true, so knowledge, action and care is actually what does the Gita, what he has, is, is really it is the different paths of attaining the ultimate and therefore we have incorporated those as our organizational values. But actually what is more important is not that. It is that we actually did a survey of all our employees. We earlier did not have these values of knowledge, action and care specified. They were, they were, and so we got an independent agency. They talked to thousands of people across different businesses that what is it you think that holds this group together and these were the values. So even people relate to them. I think people are also happy. And I frankly, I find that the, when there's a alignment with your own personal values and the values of the organization, that's when you get the most success and where people can give out the best. Because they don't think that at home I have to live like this. But when I come to the organization, I live a separate life. So I think in that sense, I find that this is a very powerful construct. And again and again, I'm saying these are not values which are Indian, or you can say it's only from uh, our scriptures. These are universal values which are accepted anywhere and everywhere in the world. In fact, the only thing I find people like when we acquire our different businesses is our values. That's the most important thing they like. That's interesting. A lot of companies, rather most companies write a mission statement. Uh, I'm sure you do too. Is there any measure where that is reviewed from time to time? Otherwise it's written and forgotten and it's for... No, so as I said, our purpose or mission is the same thing. Our purpose is discussed at length. The purpose is, as I said and I'll repeat it, that doing well and doing good and making a positive difference to the world around us by living our values of knowledge, action, and care. And these are actually discussed, they are measured. If people, their behaviors do not align with our values of knowledge, action, and care, then they are not part of our organization. When we do, when we are doing social, or CSR as it's called, we also measure how you do it, whether you do it well or not. It's not only doing good, but do you do, do it well? Are you making a necessary impact into what you are doing? Similarly, when we are doing something, when you are doing a construction or a building, is it, are you not only doing it well, but is it doing good to the society around us? We look at all these things. And it is done on a constant basis. Um, one more for you, Mr. Pirama. Generally, even as employees, you develop an attachment with the organization that you work for. How easy or difficult was it for you to let go? As the promoter, do you feel attached to your company and employees? So, you know, uh, this is again the teaching of the Gita. There's a lot of passion in building the business. And believe me, I put more passion than, or as much passion than most people would do. 
but yet I think there's detachment. You have to do, if you are a trustee, you have to do what is in the right for your beneficiaries. And we felt that when we let go of this business, we were doing best for our beneficiaries, whether it was our customers, whether it was our employees, whether it was the shareholders. So again and again, I think we are fortunate, or at least I'm fortunate, I've been blessed that I can take this detached view, that what is right, we have to do it. And that's it. In fact, Many people question, you know, this is what your business was, this is how you were known, why did you do it? After all, money is not everything. I said, that's not the case. It is, I think, you have to do what is right. But if I can flip a previous question around, somebody asked you whether the purpose of life was a moving target. If I had to ask you that the business environment in our country is a moving target, there is no policy that stays or consistently stays. Would you choose to stay the course based on the values that you uh, have begun the journey See, with? you know, everybody criticizes our country, and most businessmen do, but I don't know of any other country. In 1988, we invested, six crores was the total value of our business. Or we invested personally one and a half crores. That became 18,000 in 20 years. If you tell me any other country where you can make so much value, then why are we criticizing? And in spite of all the policies, in spite of everything, and in spite of not violating any laws. So it is possible to do it, and it's only, I think, because of our country, the environment, because of the people here that we could do this. So I don't buy this logic that our country is not. I mean, this is where we are, and this is what we've done. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm sorry, there's one more with me which I'm unable to read. Um, and then there's another one which, uh, do you still currently run or own the textile business? What changes did you make to make it feasible to run today? No, so we don't run it. We have, a, I mean, so we had a family division 10 years ago and it's gone to the other part of the family. So we don't run it. Okay, I'm presently out of questions. Anybody else uh, has something to share? Please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Sorry, what is the question? Uh, Indian pharma industry, we know there is a lot of... Yeah, I got your back. Yeah, what is the question? Was it a foresight that you thought that you should get out? Or is it that you know you took a call without knowing that it's going to happen? No, I think we could see whatever is happening now was seen five, seven years ago. So there's nothing, nothing unusual that has happened. So we saw what was coming. At least whatever has happened, we... I have not seen anything which is exceptionally different than what we had thought. Like the companies what you talked of, uh, Roche or Gorilla, everybody has come back and said shop now. Yeah, so it's good, no? The, I mean, there must be change. So different people look at it in a different eye. So we are, uh, we are happy, but uh, we expected this. You're talking business or personal? Personal business. So business, you know, I mean, we always have these growth targets and this and that. You know, you have to grow our business, you have to become whatever. Personal, of course, is uh, what Swamiji keeps teaching us. The pursuit of happiness. That is the goal. It's easy, it's that difficult to achieve. But so. how do you define that? No, so okay, on a serious basis, I think uh, what we are trying to do is, uh, again, how do we give back to society? That's a big part of uh, the whole emphasis that we are putting as a group and as us personally. What do we do? How do we make the world a better place? So that 
what I believe is that when you came in, the uh, world around you was, say, something. Can you make even a slight difference to make it better? So we are working, for instance, in the spaces of education. We are working in healthcare. We are working in terms of empowerment, youth leadership. So this is why, where we are trying to make a difference. And can you make a real difference in India? Because in India, to make a difference, you have to work on scale. So that's one of the initiatives that we are trying to do as uh, personally and as a group. Again, how can you really become, how can, I mean, some, my own personal thing is, how can I really get into the feeling that I'm just a mere instrument? It's easy to say it. You're just a mere instrument, and you're not doing these things. To remove, to get to that stage is my immediate goal. Okay, with that, I think we conclude the Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Karamal, for being here this afternoon.